Great. Hello, everybody. Thank you for staying around for the closing keynote. Thank you to all of the organizers of B-Side Scotland. Um, it is wonderful to be here and um, giving the closing keynote. It's a big honor. Um, so I am talking today about um, communication in cybersecurity. So anybody that knows me or that has seen me speak before, seen me on Twitter, you'll know that that's kind of a theme of my work, is all about how we communicate about cybersecurity and what we can do to perhaps communicate more effectively. Um, and when I say communicate, I mean kind of with everybody, whether that is in general, kind of in the media, whether that is with people in your personal life at home, whether that is um, to kids at school, or in organizations doing awareness raising, speaking to the board, just chatting about cybersecurity in any format. Um, that's kind of what interests me, what really drives me and motivates me is understanding why people behave the way they do and how we can maybe positively influence them to behave in a more safe and secure way online. So for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm just going to take uh, a minute to introduce myself. I'm the co-founder, along with FC, of Redacted Firm. Um, we are a UK-based cybersecurity consultancy, and what we're really interested in is looking at cybersecurity from what we would say are the three main angles, physical, digital, and human. And we are interested in trying to demystify cybersecurity from all of those angles and make it more accessible um, for the average person. So I've worked in this industry for about eight years, and I've worked in consultancy roles, I've worked um, heading up awareness campaigns in organizations, and I worked for some time with an investigations and disputes team, so kind of looking at the aftermath of when an incident has happened and what we can do to mop that up from the human side. I also run the website cyber.uk and that is aimed at discussing cybersecurity, making resources and news and stuff available um, to anybody interested in cybersecurity. Um, one thing that I have on that site that I try to keep up to date, uh, haven't done such a good job on that lately, um, but it's the um, events, a calendar of all the UK events about cybersecurity. So if you run an event, whether it's a local event, national event, send me the details, I'll put it up on that calendar so people can see when stuff is happening. But that's the kind of boring intro. You could find out all that stuff about me from LinkedIn. Who wants to hear that? It's the end of the day. Um, we're here to have some fun as well as talk about cybersecurity. Um, so here's a little bit more about who I am as a person. I am Dr. Jessica Barker. Of course, not this kind of doctor. Sadly, not this kind of doctor. There's time, maybe. Um, I am, of course, this kind of doctor, so I can't help when something like this happens because, as you will appreciate, my work is much more serious. I work in cybersecurity, as you know, but I am not one of these. I am not one of these, and I only occasionally get to go to work dressed like this. My background is in sociology. Uh, sociology and sort of town planning stuff. Um, so I am very interested in the human side of cyber security. Working, running a consultancy as a consultant, people who are not consultants often say, What's, what does that even mean? It's a very fuzzy term. What do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, consultants, we do very important work, like writing the word success on a transparent wall doing lots of jigsaw puzzles, and I like to hone core skills in giving high fives and fist bumps. I'm coming to you for one. Yes, good fist bump. Very good at the high fives and the fist bumps. So that means I get to do lots of stuff like this. So I talk about cybersecurity all around the world, um, do lots of media stuff, lots of outreach stuff. But the media come to me um, quite regularly. I'm in Grazia this week, thank you very much. Um, and they come to me because I talk about cybersecurity in pretty much non-technical terms. I'm kind of the middle person translating the technical stuff for a non-technical audience. But usually what that means is responding to the latest attack or breach. So you might sometimes turn on the TV and see me on there looking shocked. <sighs> You might see me on there looking disappointed. <laughs> of course, you're going to see me looking angry. And on a really bad day, you might catch me looking sad. 
You all know that working in cybersecurity makes you shocked, angry, disappointed, and sad on a regular basis. That's why I'm talking about optimism today. Um, so I think it's important to, we're dealing with difficult problems. We're all very busy people. I think it's good to let off steam in your personal life. So I do stuff like this. And I do stuff like this. And I make stuff like this. Alarm clock, not bomb. And stuff like this, an excuse to use a hammer. So. That is me. And as I've said in my intro, obviously working in cybersecurity, we're dealing with problems all the time. We are probably attracted to this industry and we work in this industry um, because we are looking for problems. We're looking for where things don't work. Um, we are trained to look for flaws and to think about workarounds and to deal with some difficult challenges. But what I want to talk about today is why it's important in my mind to be optimistic um, and how I think we can be more optimistic as an industry. Now, I'm not, I've, I've done, I've not done this talk before. There's a few slides if you've seen me talk recently that you might have seen in another talk. I've built this talk out of um, a, a bigger talk I do. So this is kind of one section of a talk I've been giving recently and I've expanded it to dwell a little bit more on optimism. So the other talk I've been giving is about human biases, and it's about why people maybe aren't engaging with cybersecurity that much. And one of those sections was about optimism, but I wanted to talk about it in more detail. Sometimes I think people get a bit confused when they hear me talk about optimism and they think that maybe I'm trying to deny that there are problems um, or I'm being a bit, you know, trying to be a bit Pollyanna and to say, you know, everything's going to be fine. And of course, that's not what I am uh, doing. I work with people day to day. I do awareness tra training, so I'm very familiar uh, with some of the challenges that we face. But for me, it's more about um, how we approach our problems and the mindset that we have. And that's what I am trying to get at when I talk about being optimistic. So the first section that I'm going to talk about is why we should be optimistic. What really, I'm, an, I'm naturally quite an optimistic person. That's just my personality. Um, but I really became interested in this and people had pointed out over time they'd see me give a talk and I guess looking back most of the themes of my conference talks there is an optimistic element to it. People do comment on me being optimistic um, but I wasn't really aware of kind of why it was important until I started reading up on some of the psychology around optimism. And there's been a lot of research over the last decade or so, a lot of it led by a neuroscientist called Dr. Tally Sherrott. She works with um, University College London and MIT, and she's done loads of research into what she has called the optimism bias. So Dr. Sherrott was looking at memory. She was really interested in whether people's memory of past events influenced whether they were optimistic or pessimistic about what was going to happen in the future. And what she found that was even when she asked people to imagine quite mundane things in their future, like putting the bins out or brushing their teeth. When she would ask them to imagine it and, and kind of describe a scenario, they would tend to describe kind of very fanciful stuff. They would describe sort of something absolutely amazing happening. Um, it would never be just a mundane task that they would describe. So she started to look into this more and started to be quite intrigued by this idea that we're optimistic. So she's done about a decade of research uh, with various different research teams around the world. And what she's found is that most people veer towards being optimistic in their personal lives. So for example, um, if you ask someone on the day of their wedding, what are the statistics around people getting divorced? <laughs> they will know that about 50% of people in their marriages end up getting divorced. But ask someone if they think they are likely to get divorced, then of course on their wedding day they're going to say, no, there is zero chance, it's just not going to happen to me. So people think the bad stuff happens to other people and not to them. So then the issue with this, when it comes to cybersecurity, we face this kind of um, issue where if we try and tell people, you know, 
However many percentage of organizations get hacked, everybody's going to get breached sometime. It's not a matter of if, but when. The response will always be, well, why would hackers want my data? It's not going to happen to me. Why would anybody hack me? They're going to hack the guy next door. And our response to that really as an industry is usually to kind of shout louder, to confront them with more facts, to tell them, no, actually, you are going to get hacked. It is going to happen to you, to try and prove it. We try and kind of beat the optimism out of them, usually with facts. But what this research um, into neuroscience has proven is that optimism is more powerful than facts. So one study that um, Dr. Sherrod did with her team was to get a group of people and to ask them how likely they thought they were of getting cancer. And what she found is that people generally would answer like about 10%. They thought they had about a 10% likelihood of getting cancer. So the scientists would then explain to them, oh, well, actually, we all have about a 30% chance of getting cancer. And then they'd ask them again, so now you know the fact, how likely do you think it is that you're going to get cancer? And they would say, oh, well, maybe it's 11% then. <laughs> so people still didn't think it was going to happen to them. They still thought, yeah, but I look after myself, I exercise, I eat well. They came up with all of the excuses as to why, okay, that might be the statistic, but I'm going to buck the trend. It's not going to happen to me. And of course, this is what people do when we talk to them about cybersecurity, when we give them all the facts and all the figures. They think, yeah, that might happen to other people, but it's, it's not going to happen to me. And then another issue that we have, the more we tell them that these bad things are going to happen, of course, if they don't happen, and um, I'm very happy that both the opening and the closing keynote today, we've uh, topped and tailed the day by talking about the boy who cried wolf. Because, of course, if we tell people that the bad thing is going to happen, the sky is going to fall in, the sky is going to fall in, the sky is going to fall in, the breaches happen, data is exposed, it's lost, but the sky doesn't fall in. So people then come to kind of see our warnings as just white noise. So we have to be very careful with how we pitch our warnings and our communications, because if we're too alarmist, people end up just switching off. So the optimism bias. The good news about the optimism bias is that uh, optimism actually, of course, makes people try harder. So if we try to just convince them that it is actually terrible, the internet is broken, you are going to get breached, then of course what people do is they say, well, what's the point? Um, you know, well, I'm never going to, I'm going to be hacked anyway, so why should I worry about it? Why should I spend the money on it? If we tell people, actually, there are lots of things you can do, there's some quite straightforward, some simple things, and okay, it's not going to remove the whole risk, but it's going to really help minimize your risk, um, and let, I'm going to help you do it, and then, of course, they're going to try harder. If you think that something is achievable, then it's generally it's just common sense, but it has been proven by science that people will put their mind to it and put more effort into it. The other um, thing about optimism and the reason that I think the psychology lends itself um, to being quite important to us as an industry is that a lot of research suggests that being optimistic is better for your health than, health than being pessimistic. So there's been research around heart disease, around strokes, around immune systems, and some people um, argue with it, but there's been a great deal of research. And it suggests that if you're pessimistic, you're more likely to suffer from heart disease, you're more likely to suffer from a stroke, and that potentially weakens, uh, being pessimistic also potentially has an impact weakening your immune system. So as individuals, taking a more optimistic view seems like it has been scientifically proven to be actually good for our health. So that is the psychology. But that might sound all well and good, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can put it into practice or it doesn't necessarily mean it's rooted in something that's actually sort of very helpful. So what I also had been reading about and thinking about planning for this talk was other challenges that we've faced. So when we are very pessimistic about cybersecurity, I kind of think about all the things we've achieved as humans. <laughs> I look at the world around us and I think really is internet security like the problem that we just can't solve when we've solved and achieved so many other things? Is that really the case? Aren't we capable of more than that? 
So I wanted to take a minute in this talk and look at some of the big challenges that we've overcome to think about whether cybersecurity is another one in those line of challenges that, of course, is difficult, but that doesn't mean that we aren't capable of eventually solving it or getting ahead, um, actually kind of eventually beating the attackers. And so the first challenge that I started thinking about, and in terms of this, the book Homo Deus is really interesting. If you've not read it, it is about the past and the future of humanity. Um, kind of looks to the past to think about where we might be going, and it's a really interesting read. And one thing that the book does is it goes through some of these really big scale challenges that we've faced as humans and considers the progress that we've made around them. And one of the things it discusses is um, famine and the fact that we no longer suffer from natural famine anymore. Of course, this is not to say that there isn't a lot of hunger in the world, because of course there is. There are millions of people who are hungry. There is a great problem around food insecurity, nutritional insecurity, but natural wide-scale famines don't happen anymore. When there is a famine now, we recognize that it is a political failure. We don't just think that it has been sent by the gods and there's nothing we can do about it. We actually challenge the status quo and we say this shouldn't have happened. Uh, we need to work harder to make sure it doesn't happen again. If we go back a few hundred years, um, we can look at the scale of the problem of famine. And it's phenomenal to think that there were countries a few hundred years ago where 15, 20, 25% uh, of the population died from famine. And then if we look to more recent times, we can see that actually eating too much food has actually become worse for our health and more of a problem in terms of public health than having too little food. So famine, a huge problem, and we have managed as humanity, it has taken us time, but we have managed to rid the world of natural famine. If we think about cybersecurity and the time frame that we have been living with the internet and trying to secure it, then of course we're a tiny, tiny part of the way in compared to dealing with some of these other challenges, such as epidemics. Again, just like famine, when there is an epidemic now and it spreads, we don't see that as something that is just natural, something that has just happened, something that we have to unfortunately accept. Instead, we recognize that that is a political failure. And this quote really stood out to me because I thought this is kind of what we are trying to achieve in cybersecurity. You know, we all recognize there's never going to be 100% security. That's not where we realistically expect to get to. But winning the arms race, getting ahead of the attackers on a large scale, that's kind of where we want to be. And again, we can look at epidemics and we can see... Um, you know, hundreds of years ago, some huge epidemics spreading around the world. Um, and at that time, authorities didn't even know what caused them. Um, one of the main theories was that it was bad air, miasma. Um, what we have now, the, the way that we live now, a lot of people predicted that with growing populations and with greater international travel, that we would have more of a problem with epidemics, that of course there would be more germs spreading faster. But because of advances in modern medicine, we no longer have this. We can go back only a hundred years, so there are people who are alive today who were born before the Spanish flu, and that shows us just how recent some of this problem still was. More people died from the Spanish flu just after World War I than actually died in the war itself. So we can see this as a huge challenge that we actually have overcome fairly recently. Of course, we still face epidemics. Um, we still see people dying of horrible diseases, new diseases emerging um, and starting to spread. But what we have started to do is get ahead of the game. So smallpox, the first um, epidemic to be um, eradicated by human action. Polio, very close to being eradicated. So what we can see that with time, with a lot of money, with a lot of research, a lot of effort, these diseases are contained. 
When SARS hit, it was expected that that would be the new Black Death. You'll remember a lot of the news about that, a lot of the panic about it. And in the end, of course, it's, it's tragic, it's awful that people die from these diseases, but it didn't spread the way that people expected. The same with Ebola. And then, of course, we get to AIDS. And AIDS, of course, has killed millions of people and a much more challenging ec epidemic to try and deal with as humans. Um, AIDS was um, a unique challenge to the medical community because when somebody um, got the virus, they didn't present with symptoms immediately. So the disease was spread um, without people knowing that they were spreading it, without people knowing that they were ill. So it spread very quickly. Um, but also when people presented themselves with the virus, the virus of course doesn't kill you. It weakens your immune system, so some people were dying from cancer, some from pneumonia, from other linked diseases, so it's quite hard to find the root cause. So it was a really big challenge, and yet uh, within 10 years of it being identified, AIDS was um, got to the point where it was managed as a chronic condition. As long as there was the money there to do it, then AIDS is actually manageable. If we think back to whether AIDS had emerged hundreds of years ago, the impact that that would have had on the global population um, would have been much starker. So as humanity, we have managed to really um, get a grip on e epidemics and limit the, the impact and the spread that they have. Another big challenge that as humanity we have faced and managed to massively overcome is around global violence, traditional warfare. And what we now see is a great uh, reduction in violence. I think people still think that, you know, we live in a violent society. Of course, violence does happen. People do die um, from violence, but it's been greatly reduced. And again, we can see, you know, obviously everybody worries about terrorism. Obviously terrorist attacks are awful, but we can see the small percentage of people that die from terrorist violence compared to something like obesity. And now we conceive of peace in a different way. So when uh, World War I was brought to a close and people would say, we now have peace between Britain and Germany, what this meant was that we were no longer at war. Whereas now we talk about peace as being war is inconceivable. We can't imagine being at war with Germany. So we've really moved on in terms of violence and peace on a global level. We can look a little bit closer at World War I and um, particular the Battle of Verdun lasted a phenomenally long time, killed a huge amount of people. And part of the reason that World War I killed so many people is that it was a 19th century war using 20th century weaponry. And I think this is quite a nice analogy for cybersecurity, thinking about how we can keep our tactics up to date with the attacks that we're seeing. Just before I was um, on Twitter looking over my slides, stuff like that, and I don't know if people saw the news that has emerged today. I don't know if people saw the handshake, the historic handshake. Uh, this morning we were getting ready and uh, saw it on Twitter. Phenomenal to see that a peace deal has been struck between North and South Korea. And I thought it was quite amazing timing just before I start to talk about the fact that we are overcoming global violence to see that this, um, these two um, countries have managed to strike this deal of, of peace. And what's particularly interesting is that King Jun, Un, King Yun, King, 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 I can never say his name. Sorry. Yes, him. When he came to power, everybody said it's going to get worse. He's going to be worse than his father. We can expect more violence, more war, uh, more statements of power. There's been lots of discussion in the last couple of years over North Korea and cyber attacks. And then what we've seen is actually a reach out for peace. And I thought the most amazing thing to see in the uh, handshake this morning was when he took the leader from South Korea back to stand in the demilitarized zone and to pose for a photo there. And for him, he obviously wanted, or him and his team decided, that getting that image was a positive thing. So, we have um, a lot of evidence from human history to show that, yes, we face 
big challenges, big problems, but we're capable of overcoming them. So if we can overcome famine, if we can overcome ep epidemics, if we can overcome global violence to such an extent, of course, the challenges are all still there, but they're much more manageable, then can't we do it with cybersecurity? Um, so I started to think about um, things we can be optimistic about, achievements that we have made. And I tweeted the other day about how I was giving this talk. And Quentin, I don't know if um, people in the room, I know some will know Quentin, um, he's a CISO. And he came back saying he'd been having a similar conversation, thinking about the achievements that we've made in InfoSec in the last 10 years. So why are we uh, not optimistic? I think one reason is that we focus so much more on breaking. And I don't mean to criticize that. Of course, it's good that we talk about flaws. It's good that people publish their research. It's good that we have an awareness of where there are problems and flaws and issues. But what I think would be beneficial for the industry is to focus more also on achievements, on solutions, on where we have fixed things. We don't often take stock. We move on to the next problem without acknowledging that actually there's a bunch of stuff that we have fixed or improved. So one thing we've, this is very recent, we've started to put together in Redacted is a timeline. In preparing for this talk, I was looking for a timeline of security achievements. <laughs> I can't find one online, like three of us were looking for it, and none of us can find it. You can find loads of timelines of malware and ransomware and attacks and worms and viruses, but there doesn't seem to be anything chronicling, chron chron why can't I speak today? Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything capturing the achievements that we've made. Thank you, Andy. Um, why is this? Why have we not, why has nobody been interested enough to say these are the things that we have done? These are the foundations that we've built in terms of security. So we've started putting it together. It is certainly far from complete. There will be some glaring holes in it, which I think is great news because this is about what we could fit onto the page quickly. Um, and there's loads more. And the way I look at it is to see 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, we start to build kind of the basics of um, kind of technical security. We start to put some of the measures in place in terms of encryption, in terms of firewalls, um, in terms of PGP bug bounties. We start building up a little bit more into kind of the community stuff, OWASP. And then um, we get a little bit more sophisticated. We get VPNs, um, two-factor um, emerges and starts to be pushed. It was only in 2011 that Google introduced two-factor to Gmail. Then um, very recently, this year, last year, um, Google decided, of course, that there are issues um, with two-factor SMS. And so they have made the default to be Google Prompt, where you don't have to get a code um, by SMS. You just have to say, yes, I'm trying to log in on your phone. So what we can see in the last year or so is um, a move towards a more holistic approach to cybersecurity. So we've kind of built up a lot of the technical stuff. We've solved a lot of the technical problems. What that has done is that has pushed attackers into making more human-based attacks. And so we're starting to build up some of the more human-based defenses. So looking at attacker heuristics and how we can identify accounts being hijacked, and also looking more at the physical stuff and how the physical stuff can be compromised to um, carry out a larger cyber attack. So um, I wasn't really familiar with this, with this until recently, but the Internet Atlas, which is the first really large scale mapping of the physical structure of the Internet. Sadly, it's flash based. <laughs> Um, so I'm hoping they're going to sort that out um, because none of us have looked at it yet to see if it's actually as good as it seems to be. Um, but in theory, that's a great thing, all moving in the right direction. So we've achieved loads of stuff, but we don't really recognize it. And we can consider why... Um, why we tend to be cynical and why security comes late, why it isn't built in from the start. And for this, I found a really interesting talk online um, by Alex Gantman at Qualcomm. And he was talking about the fact that he's worked in the industry, it seems, for decades. And he used to be nicknamed Dr. Evil. 
He said he spent about 10 years predicting the next terrible cyber attack, the doomsday, you know, die hard for scenario where the lights are going to go out and we're going to be doomed and catastrophe is going to rain down on us. So he spent about 10 years predicting these and making these comments and then it would never happen. So he then kind of flipped it around and he realized in his words that there is a natural evolution of technology and that actually technology, we build it and we think that we, we can control it. We think that we are the gods of technology, but actually technology takes on its own um, evolution. And as a community, we build it and we make it stronger. So he actually now has the nickname Mr. Positive because he's completely changed his frame of mind. And one thing he talks about, uh, one thing that the article says, is that when innovation slows, security grows. So he makes the analogy with the car industry. And he says that all of the kind of convenience and nice features in a car were in there first. The radio, the air con, all of that stuff was put into a car first. And then only when all of those nice convenience features started to be stabilized and all cars had them, did the industry look at seatbelts and putting seatbelts in. And so he draws that reference with PCs and says that in the 1990s, early 90s, PCs were changing, being upgraded so often. You'd buy a PC, you'd get it home, you'd set it up. By the time you'd done that, it would be out of date. So when you got a virus, you were kind of glad because it meant you had an excuse to go and buy another one. By the 2000s, um, firmware started to stabilize. People wanted to invest and keep their PCs longer. And so there started to be more of a drive and an emphasis on security. Around this time, Bill Gates published the trustworthy computer memo to um, Microsoft employees saying, you know, we've had lots of nice stuff with PCs. What we now need to do is look at how we can make them trustworthy, how we can make them secure. So this is all kind of quite recent. Cybersecurity is, I mean, the digital age is recent. I agree with Paul's point this morning that we don't really know where we are with it. We haven't really considered the pace of technology, the influence that that has on our lives. And the fact that security hasn't been built in, the fact that we are still having to struggle and fight, actually, we're kind of still at day one or maybe day two. We're so early on as an industry, we've got a long way to go. And that feels frustrating, but I think we just have to accept that, that that's the way it is. And what we can look to do is make incremental gains, improve as we go, get in the right direction, not expect that this can be fixed overnight. One thing we certainly should be optimistic about is that we have more money than ever before. Um, so I'm going to check my stats. Gartner has predicted um, that security spending will reach $90 billion this year. With $90 billion, you can buy every sports team in the world. Not just in football, every sports team twice over. <laughs> that is a lot of money. Um, so we have a lot of money. And everybody, of course, feels like they want more budget. That's not to say every organization has a good budget. But as a whole, we're getting money. And we're also getting attention. We're getting attention from the board of organizations. We're also getting attention from people at home. Cybersecurity is on the BBC more than ever. It's on Sky News. It's in all of the mainstream media. And it's also reaching women's fashion magazines. One of the best resources for cybersecurity guidance is Teen Vogue in America. And I picked out their two-factor authentication article, but there are so many more. They do so much good stuff around cybersecurity. Um, and we've seen profiles of women in cybersecurity. So there you've got Zoe Rose in Vogue magazine recently. I was in Grazia. We're seeing people who would be non-traditional audiences being interested in cybersecurity. And that's an amazing position to be in. A lot of other social causes, a lot of other causes that are looking for change, looking to improve uh, things in society, they would give their eyes teeth to have that kind of awareness, to have that kind of attention. And we've got people coming to us asking for it, asking for information, asking for help. So 
I have argued that optimism would be good for us. As an industry, it would help us enact more change. It would be good for us as individuals. I've argued that we have reason to be optimistic because humanity is able to overcome big challenges. And I've also argued that we have reason to be optimistic because actually there's lots of good stuff happening in the industry. That's all well and good, but how can we practice optimism? How can we actually change what is quite a cynical culture in our industry to be a more optimistic one? And one thing I was thinking about was um, around athletes and the Olympics. So 11,000 athletes um, took part in the Rio Olympics. They all go into it thinking that they're going to win, thinking that they're going to get a medal, and a handful of them do. So how do they have that kind of optimism? Because they need that belief to do well, to do as well as they can. They have to believe in themselves. And what they are coached in is very much not looking at the big picture, not trying to, not doing their training. They've got to train for four years, not doing their training in year one, year two, year three, not even going into the Olympics, thinking about the big goal that they have. Instead, they're trained to think about the next goal and the next goal and to build up bit by bit. And I thought this was a nice way of thinking about cybersecurity. We often kind of look at the big picture and we often worry about the fact that the internet is broken. But instead, if we think about smaller goals and if we try and focus on just getting some achievements bit by bit, that's going to be our best way of maintaining optimism. Because this is not how uh, success happens. It is not a lined process that always goes in the right direction. We have to accept that it looks more like this, uh, more like it does on the right, if not with more dips downwards. And I think somewhere where we could improve in cybersecurity is to have more of a culture of failure. So to acknowledge and accept that things go wrong, that we make mistakes, that there are attacks, and not to always point the finger and victim blame and call out companies um, and be so quick to pile on and lay blame. More of a culture of failure would help us to learn from the mistakes and would help us to not feel like it's the end of the world when you know there is a breach or when something happens. But instead to acknowledge that we are going to face setbacks. That doesn't mean that the whole world is doomed. So if you are, um, if you get a, a block of, of marble and you want to carve a statue, you, I can't even imagine how you conceive of that. How do you conceive of making something like that, chipping something like that out of a big block of, of marble? What you do is you just have to chip away at it. You're not going to get to that overnight, but you have to trust that the process will win out and you will end up achieving what is your vision. And this is where I think we need to be. We need to think about how we can make improvements bit by bit, how we can chip away at this problem without worrying about trying to solve it overnight. So this... Um, this slide is from the work by Carol Dweck, um, who is a psychologist who has looked a lot at mindset. And she talks about the importance of a growth mindset. So she contrasts that with a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is the idea that you have to have talent to do something, that um, something is either going to work or it's not. The growth mindset, which has been, um, the work has been pioneered by Carol Dweck, is really to understand that actually if you work at something, if you keep going at it, you will achieve it. We're all capable of that. And that failure should not be seen as the limit of what we can achieve, but actually an opportunity to learn and grow. And what I wanted to leave you all on was a quote from an article that I saw a few months ago um, by Bob Cavello. And he's talking about, uh, why it stood out for me is he's talking about the InfoSec industry being young. And he's talking about some of the issues that I've mentioned in this presentation, that actually we've got a long way to go compared to other industries. We are very new. And one thing he says is that Instead of us trying to think about solving this problem immediately, what we should be thinking about right now in cybersecurity is how we're laying foundations for the future generations. 
We are not going to solve the issues of cybersecurity overnight, but what we can do is lead the way in creating an industry and a community that puts it in the best possible position for the next generation and the generation after that. If you've not seen the article, I'd highly recommend you to go and look at it. It's a really interesting and really optimistic approach to cybersecurity and the industry. And so I thought that was a nice way to end my talk today. If you've got any questions, I would be very happy to hear them now, or you can contact me, email, Twitter. Twitter's probably best. Um, and I would look forward to having a conversation with you all. Thank you for your time and attention.